I suppose um, we can make it so that people are hesitant to come later by telling them they're going to be live on Facebook when they do. Because there's, there's five or six people coming in that will all be on Facebook now. <laughs> when I start praying. So what does the what does the phone say? Six thirty two? Six thirty two. Well let us begin with prayer. Almighty God, Lord of harmony and peace, who sets the limits and boundaries of the nations and marks the paths of history in your wisdom, cause all strife and misunderstanding to cease and grant peace to our nation. Make our nation and its citizens law-abiding and moral people. Grant health and strength and wisdom to those in authority and prevent godless and wicked people from corrupting our land. From day to day, grant us the grace to live peaceably with those in our community, at work, at church, that our conduct and speech may give honor to you and your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. So if you turn to page six in your booklet, you will see we left off on question 11. We answered that last week, and we'll be on question 12 here tonight, which which works out really quite well because it's a bit of a a summary of what we looked at last week. Now my my goal, my, my prayer, my hope is that this evening you'd be challenged. And challenged in the sense of saying, where have I failed? How have I failed, and in what ways can I, in repentance, seek to amend my ways and live in such a way the Lord wants me to do, and the way the Lord wants me to live? Um, Because we're going to talk about what are ways that the early Christian church demonstrated that they were Christians in difficult and hard times. And in seeing that, how can we relate it to ourselves and the time in which we live right now as well? But before we get there, let's just take the summary point of question 12. Um, From what we've learned so far, complete the statements below to identify the primary differences between the church, that is the kingdom of God, and the state, the other kingdom. So the church is established by what? By God, through the gospel. So, correct, by God. We could say by God for both of them because the state is established in that regard by God too, but he gives or he says, I will establish that that kingdom of grace by means of my gospel. And the, 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 the state is established by what? Say it again. Law. Law? Um, Yes, but maybe a better way of saying it is how do they enforce the law? With the sword, correct. So, the state is established by the sword. Church is governed by 
So if you think about last week, we said um, the church and the church finds truth by means of what? Or so it's governed by what? God's word. The state, on the other hand, governed by what? even if we're looking at all different sorts of countries, still going to boil down to the same thing that's governing it. Man, and we speak of it as human reason. And sometimes you see that human reason acting out in ways that are proper, in ways that we would hope that would act out. Um, And just because human reason can act out in a moral way does not mean it always is going to act out in a moral way. Um, The church is going to last, how long? Forever. We are told it will never perish. The state, however, kingdom of this world, they only Last for a while. Yeah, they fall, don't they? Um, Kingdom of this world will fall. They come and they go. They come and they go. Uh, we've, we've seen that throughout the history of the world, and it is only reasonable to consider it will continue that way until our Lord comes again. Um, You know, we've talked about it before just in passing in Bible studies. You know, history would go to show that a a country, a state, a government, a a world power usually only stays on the scene for about 200 years. Um, Do a little bit of math. Add up how much and how long America has been a world power. Um, it shouldn't surprise us that we see things going on the way they're going on. Um, Continuing on. The church. God's people distinguish themselves by what or how? By love. love. And we can summarize that idea of love all in that humble service. But the rulers of this world, what do they seek? Power. Same thing everybody else is going to say. Power, their own glory, don't they? There may be a few rare exceptions throughout the history of the world, but for the most part, the rulers of this world are simply seeking their own glory. Um, Isn't that something that comes again and again into our prayers for our, our own nation? Is, Lord, allow the individuals who rule to rule in such a way as they're ruling not for political lines, political parties, for their own glory, but for the good of the people that they're supposed to be ruling. It's really a prayer, isn't it, that we ask again and again. And the church moves by faith or on faith. And the state, it moves by sight. So we kind of encapsulate, we kind of give that overview, we summarize what we talked about in these differences between the kingdom of grace as well as the kingdom of this world. So important, so vital for us to keep these things in mind. Um, Two kingdoms. As Christians, we are citizens within both kingdoms, but both kingdoms have completely different purposes. The idea that we see the kingdoms in this world. The idea that they have those boundaries, kind of like we talked about last week. Yeah. Question 13. 
In the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, theorists such as Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau came up with a line of thought that sought to explain the origin of government and the obligation of subjects. Much of what they came up with can be summed up with the term social contract. Anyone have an idea of what is meant by the term social contract? Eric. So, and, and I was reminded yesterday, it's good to repeat what people are saying since we're online since I can't hear it so well. Um, the idea that, that individuals have rights that precede that government, and when the government comes in, well, then they give up some of those rights. And, and the idea that really flowed from this social contract, or really the idea that led to this social contract, was that people started, and especially these individuals in the 16th and 17th centuries, started to say that God was not the one who established governments. But that at some point in time, humans thought government would be good, and so they are the ones who established them. Now, why bring that up? The reason is, what is the natural conclusion that must be drawn then, or that will be drawn, if God is not the one who establishes government, but rather that mankind is. Two, two things really would be highlighted in that aspect. One has to do with man's responsibility towards government, and the second would be, is what gets the ultimate and the overarching highest um, premium when it comes to the idea of government. The one would be, if mankind is the one who decided that governments are to be um, brought into existence, why wouldn't mankind decide that if they don't like it anymore, they have the right to revolt and rebel? Right? Natural conclusion. Second one is, human reason gets the absolute highest premium. So consider that idea. If God is not the one who establishes it, then individuals think they have the right to revolt and just get rid of that government and start a new one. And human reason gets the highest premium. Um, do we not see the byproduct of the idea of the social contract in our world now. There is no talk, there is no discussion, there is no real idea that government is established by God. And so people think nothing of the idea of revolt and rebellion. And what is getting the highest premium? Human reason, human reason, human reason. That's why it's so vital for us to understand God is the one who establishes the kingdom of grace and God is also the one who establishes the kingdoms of this world. Those words of Romans 13 that we looked at last week. All right, turning our page. For those who may be online, um, once again, I direct you to our FaithWell website page um, because for the next four pages, we're going to read from what we have in our, in our packet here. Um, and if you would like to follow along, you can find it um, on the drop-down Bible class, Bible study menu at our FaithWell's page. Sometimes the question is, okay, what's, what's the value of simply reading something that somebody else wrote? Um, four pages is actually not going to take a whole lot of time to go through. But there are some times that people just put things into words in such a way that you can't duplicate it without simply reading their words. And in the process of reading this, I really want you to contemplate, okay, as we consider what the early Christians did in the midst of an unjust 
a corrupt government. Compare that to what Christians are doing now in the face of such a government. And more than just what are Christians doing now in the face of such a government, what are we doing right now in the face of such a government? And this is where I want to challenge you. I'll ask you some questions after we read this that, that hopefully will bring that out. But keep those things in mind as we, as we read these words. We're just going to read these four pages. So <clears throat> you will see that this is written by Pastor James Hine. I'm a pastor within our Wisconsin Synod. And you'll see that it was first accessed on that, that website there and reprinted by that permission. So abortion then and now, what we can learn from how the early church dealt with abortion and infanticide. So without God in the future life, how will man be after that? It means everything is permitted now. Communist Russia, communist China, and Nazi Germany eliminated an incredible amount of human life. Stalin was responsible for around 20 million deaths. Mao Zedong regime is credited with a staggering 70 million deaths. Hitler comes in third with around 10 million murders attributed to his name. The 20th century was the world's great experiment in seeing what intentionally godless governments would produce. The end result was a century with more slaughter of human life than all other centuries combined. Without question, the saving grace of the Western world has been the presence of an inherited Christian worldview. Abraham Lincoln, William Wilberforce and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were able to make assertions about human rights and usher in civil rights reform based solely on a belief in the biblical image of God. The idea that all humans have value because God himself imbued humanity with special value. As the faith of a nation goes, so goes its perception of personhood. Consequently, if you've been following trends of Christian religious activity over the past 20 years, Please note, written in 2019, so um, not, not far off from where, from where we are right now. Um, it was no surprise to you that the New York State Legislature passed the Repro Reproductive Health Act on January 22nd, the 46th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. The act allows abortion at any point during a pregnancy. 24 weeks had been the prior limit, if it is deemed necessary to protect a woman's life or health. If you've ever read Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker's famous article in the New York Times from over two decades ago, you knew this was coming. If you realize that the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws targeted New York upon its founding in 1969, you knew this was coming. If you were aware that over a quarter of all pregnancies in New York already end in abortion, you knew that this was coming. When you're raised in the United States, it perhaps, it's perhaps easy to forget that abortion and infanticide have been quite common in world history. The reason they have been forbidden in the West for centuries is only because Western values were shaped by Christianity. Author Benjamin Wicker makes the case in Moral Darwinism. The laws against abortion and infanticide in the West are only intelligible as a result of its Christianization and the repeal of those same laws is only intelligible in light of its de-Christianization. A fairly apples-to-apples -apples comparison of what we see happening today in America is what was seen in the Roman Empire. The Twelve Tables, the earliest known Roman legal code, written about 450 BCE, um, that's a new way of, of kind of speaking about the years after um, and before. So BCE is before Common Era taking away the idea of um, before Christ. <clears throat> Permitted a father to expose any female infant and any deformed or weak male infant to the natural elements to let them die in the fields. That's what infanticide is. So you think of homicide, it's infanticide, an idea of killing of the infants. Seneca regarded the drowning of children at birth as both reasonable and commonplace. Tacitus stated that the Jewish mindset it is a deadly sin to kill an unwanted child, was but another of the Jews' sinister and revolting teachings. The famous Roman med medical writer Celsus goes into great detail in De Medicina about how to surgically carry out an abortion. 
Some of these thoughts are new to America, but they're not technically new. So the relevant question then is, how did the early Christians, with very little political, educational, or financial clout, react to the tragedy taking place around them? For starters, we know without question that Christians viewed abortion and infanticide as wrong. The Didache, a manual or catechism of church teachings written in the late first century, states in the second chapter, Thou shalt not murder a child by abortion, nor kill them when born. Similarly, Justin Martyr, in the middle of the second century, wrote, We have been taught that it is wicked to expose even newly born children, for we would then be murderers. And that idea of his exposing, of just laying them out for the elements to, to kill. While we do have some records of Christians writing letters to government officials in hopes of persuading them, this seemingly created little, if any, changes in government policy. Rather, historian Rodney Stark says that what truly influenced the Roman Empire to eventually become sympathetic to Christianity's pro-life stances was the Christians' willingness to provide relief for the poor and taking in and supporting babies which had been left to die by their pagan parents. Historian Will Durant wrote, In many instances, Christians rescued exposed infants, baptized them, and brought them up with the aid of community funds. The Roman Emperor Julian, writing in the 4th century, regretted the progress of Christianity. He saw that it was causing Roman paganism to crumble. Why? From his perspective, the Christian faith has been especially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar, and that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well, while those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. And here's the main takeaway. Yes, Christians should experience righteous anger at the thought of the slaughter of more unborn innocents. Anger is a mechanism that appropriately rises to defend what is right. But when anger, even righteous anger, transforms into repaying evil with evil, we forget that God alone justly brings wrath and that our job is simply to overcome evil with good. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to revenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 17-21. I see no allowance in here for self-righteous social media tirades. I see no godliness in calling names like idiots or psychopaths. I see the Apostle Paul telling us that the path to Christ-likeness is showing the same grace to enemies that God showed to us. I see Paul similarly telling the church in Corinth, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. I see the early Christian church with minimal resources actually influencing their pagan society by adopting children, providing charity to the poor, and confounding the culture by demonstration of humble sacrificial love. Social media rants cost nothing and can ruin everything. On the other hand, picking up crosses to follow Christ costs dearly but helps save the world and lifts up the name of Jesus. Interestingly, Steven Pinker cited in his New York Times article that the women who sacrifice their offspring tend to be young, poor, unmarried, and socially isolated. If provided adequate human resources, godly men who are willing to stay with them and help them raise kids, Christian friends who encourage them toward the beauty of God's will, a church that is willing to financially come alongside a young pregnant woman and give her grace instead of shame, many of these young, poor, unmarried, marginalized women would make different decisions. The quick jab, sanctimonious social media post doesn't move the needle an inch. Sacrificial love brings forth life. 
This is not to say that wisdom brought forward in videos like this one, um, and you'll, you'll notice what the video is, is he's referring to, like this one aren't enormously helpful. Being able to defend your Christian values using arguments from the natural knowledge of God are an important part of your Christian witness as well. Former N-A-R-A-L co-founder Bernard Nathanson became a pro-life activist upon viewing the undeniable evidence before him with the advent of the ultrasound, chronicled in educational film The Silent Scream. He later became a Christian. Calm, logical arguments are an essential part of the public dialogue. But the group Steven Pinker was identifying as prime candidates for abortion is shockingly close to the group of people in society that God, throughout Scripture, is constantly compelling his nation, the Old Testament, and his church, the New Testament, to watch out for. The widows, orphans, foreigners, and poor. The Lord does not tell his people to rage against the evils of the world, but rather to keep their own lives free from evil and be a light to the world. Administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. Zechariah 7, 9-10. In the recent history of American politics, when Christians shout, the country gets angry. But historically, when God's people calmly point to the truth and lovingly sacrifice like Christ to lift up life and personhood, the world has been changed. The good news is that we all have been forgiven and saved by a child whose life was unfairly taken. It was a costly tragedy for which we're all equally guilty, but in his infinite wisdom, God used this horror to bring forth spiritual life. He can do it again. Now, you're welcome to comment on that, but I would like to, you to refrain from those comments until we've taken some questions and, and perhaps made use of some of those thoughts um, in the answers to those questions. But as I preface what I preface the reading of that as I did, I hope you understand why, why I said what I said and why I said I challenge you. Challenge you to say, where have we maybe been guilty? And what can we do? And what ought we be doing? But let's take these next couple of questions over the next couple of pages, and then we'll come back to that if we want to talk about it. So how might you address the following conflicts in the life of a Christian who has citizenship in both of these kingdoms? So how might you address the conflict that comes when um, we become involved in a political discussion and want to witness to our unbelieving friends? How do you reconcile that conflict? What, what are some things that you can, you can do? Um, what are some things that we're going to want to stay away from? Evan. You bring up a couple very good points. Calmness in the interaction that you have with that individual and expressing a comfort that is ours because of what we know and who we have in Christ and in our God. Um, two excellent points to keep in mind as you have that interaction, a political discussion with that individual who is not a believer. No. Anyone, anything else? Rudy. Who 
So pointing back to that Romans 12 in the, in the article that we just read, um, that aspect of not repaying evil for evil, that aspect of love, of, of going over and above in that aspect of love, that individuals can see that as we, as we carry it out. Um, and isn't that the difference then, too, of thinking about things we wouldn't want to do? Um, we don't want to become defensive and argumentative. Um, we don't want to become offensive and to ridicule. Um, that's what the world does. Um, but that isn't giving that Christian witness. Um, we, of course, would love to bring in the whole aspects of, of everything that has to do with our faith, but we also remember, if we're talking with an individual who's an unbeliever, they're only looking at everything from a human reason point of view. Um, and there is that, that calmness and then that comfort of leading Lord willing, as, as you said, Evan, to the point of where they ask, well, how can you be that way? Um, that opens the door for me to share a whole lot more. Um, second question there. How do you address these following situ this following situation? Increasingly in our culture, we as Christians are defined by what we are against and not what we are for. And that one, I think, really ties into the article we just read. Just contemplate for a moment. Even in many of our Wisconsin Synod congregations right now, what is happening? Divorce. Okay, divorce. With everything that's going on in the political world, with mandates that are coming out from local governments. In many of our Wisconsin Synod congregations, there's a great division that's taking place inside those congregations themselves. Why? It's because people are so absolutely intent on making sure that people know what they are against. not what they're for. Christ, his word, the proclamation of the gospel and Christian love. What's happening right now in our country, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, there is a monumental divide amongst people. You are either on one side or the other. There is no gray area. And as Christians, have we been guilty of it too? And why? Because we want to make sure everybody knows what we're against. Not what we're for. Consider Ah, we'll wait. That question's coming up in a little bit. Um, we'll wait. But what are ways that we could let people know all the more about how, you know, so they can know what we're for? Not what we're against. Living that life of service, Evan. So opportunity to, to serve once again. Um, notice what's coming out, right? 
both the answers. How can we let people know what we're for? By serving, by serving. And did, did you notice once again, right? Um, the kingdom of grace. Christians are known by their humble service. Rudy. Through that example, once again, through that service. And it, it's worth hearing again and again in our, in our answer to the question, how can we let people know what we're for? Um, service is coming out again and again and again. So let's take that third one. Um, we're frustrated because the state does not reflect our Christian values. Um, how might we address that conflict as we are living in both those kingdoms? Penny. The state is not set up to be the church. It's there to be the source. Well put. The state is not set up to be the church. Um, its purpose is not to proclaim the gospel. Its purpose is not to reflect the Christian values. Um, it is meant to oversee justice. Um, we will set ourselves up for grave and great disappointment um, if we are thinking that the state should be reflecting Christian values. We, we would love them to. And God be praised and great thanksgiving be given to God when our, our state reflects even some of those moral, those moral truths. But we are setting ourselves up for a great, great disappointment if we think that the state is going to be doing that. Pastor. I just had a question of what happens then when the state interferes with the church, starts telling you what uh, you need to preach or not preach, or uh, what marriages you need to do, or whatever. And you asked the question, excellent question. I'm sure that you know the answer, but in the sense of it is finally if they come and tell us to go against God's word, um, we resist, as did the apostles. Um, we must obey God rather than men, as did many um, you know, early Christians when the governments came and did that. Um, if, the, if the government comes and seeks to become an arm of the church or to direct what the church um, does, then finally the church says, well, we won't do what you say we will still do all we can to give you respect and honor because God has called that from us to give to you. Um, and we will talk about that as we keep going along too, as we say, okay, now let's take this truth that we're, two, that we're a Christian living in, in two kingdoms, what happens when one of the kingdoms um, comes and says, and oversteps its bounds and starts directing what the church should do. Rudy. I'll speak to that a little bit more in a couple questions. Um, but you bring up a good point. One thing I was going to say, though, is, is um, I think as, as Americans, this is one of the things that we have a very difficult time with, is for our entire lifetime, and really for the entire lifetime of our parents, and pretty much for the entire lifetime of, of, of them, as long as they lived in America, we have had these freedoms. Um, blessed freedoms. And, and, and as Christians, we, we think especially of 
of you know this freedom of religion and and this this peace and now when some of those freedoms are taken away, whether we're talking about religion or whether we're talking about some of the amendments and, and the, um, the rights that those amendments are supposed to give, what is it that all of a sudden kind of rises in us? We feel this entitlement to these freedoms. Realize that in God's word, he has never once spoken that we are entitled to these freedoms. And yet, isn't that what so often drives some of the ways in which we speak and some of the ways and things we do, is this sense of entitlement to these things. Um, and that's where I kind of say, we set, up, we set ourselves up for disappointment. It doesn't, doesn't mean that in every aspect we throw up our hands and say we do nothing. But it's also a very interesting aspect of, um, as the early Christians wrote to the Romans, um, didn't have a whole lot of effect. What changed things was their service. Um, but we get this mindset because we've had all this time that this is what we, we should have. But God has never promised that. He's promised that the church will always endure. He's promised that hell and the gates of hell will not overcome his word. He's promised that the word will always endure, but he has not promised that we are entitled to all these freedoms. And it's a good thing for us to keep that in mind. Um, otherwise, we run into this you know, um, danger of thinking that all along, Jesus' only goal has been to give us this opportunity to pursue life, happiness, the American dream. That has never been his goal. But that can so easily happen if we wrap things up too closely together in the kingdom of grace and the kingdom of this world. Question 15, Romans 5.41. Jesus here refers to a Roman law that empowered a Roman soldier on the march to see someone and make that person carry the soldier's pack for one mile. Jesus says, do it and go with him an extra mile as well. Why would a Christian be willing to do this? So Matthew 5.41 says, whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. What would compel a Christian to do this and to be willing to do this? Rachel. Love for Christ that is born out of his love for us, right? Um, isn't that finally what Christ did? Um, he went beyond what was required of him. He did not have to come and suffer and die for us. There was nothing in us that merited his love. Um, that's why we're willing to do it. Now the next question, the harder one. How could we reflect this go the extra mile love in our citizenship? That's the harder one. Serving others. Has this pandemic changed us or revealed us? I'm stealing a question in a line from Pastor Robert Fleischman, whom you know because he came here as a guest preacher. Seems like eons ago now, but... And when I talk about change or reveal us, in what say, way has it revealed us? So if we consider that all of God's law, as he, as he speaks to us and lays it down before us, um, has says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. When the pandemic hit and things were closed down and the stock market went down, was your first thought about God and your neighbor or yourself? Perhaps the pandemic has revealed us then and really where we've been. We've gotten so caught up with all the creature comforts of this world and of our life. that The pandemic has revealed that we're rather selfish. 
that service has been really a secondary thing in our mind. And it carries over, doesn't it? Once again, come back, bring it back into the, to the modern, present day. What about all the things that are seeking to divide society and even Christians today? Why is the division coming? Because I'm so intent on getting my right. Not because I'm intent on the good of the other. I think in many regards it has revealed us. And for that we can actually say, Lord, thank you for revealing that truth that we can once again calibrate our mind to follow your will and your word. Um, but service, what are some of those ways in which we can serve? Um, how about volunteering in our community? Um, I can't help but think, as you read, we read that article um, about the, the way the early Christians served, um, maybe we are not in the position to be able to go out because there are probably a whole lot more laws today than there were then just to go pick up a child that was laying out and bring it home in their mind now. You can't do that. You're probably going to jail if you do. Um, but while we might not be in a position to go pick up a child or maybe even adopt a child, can we not, and are we not in a position to support something like a Christian Life Resources that are doing that very work on our behalf? Constantly talking individuals who are pregnant, who are thinking of an abortion, out of the abortions, and saying, and we'll provide for you financially until you're on your feet? There's ways to serve. What about the way in which we talk about our government right now and the state leaders? And, and how often aren't the things that we talk about in, in the aspects of the, of the leaders that we have really a case of I'm speaking poorly about them, I'm running them through the mud because they are preventing me from getting my way and what I want. And they're not necessarily telling me to go against God's word. They're infringing what I deem as an entitled freedom. Um, even sitting down, thinking about it ahead of time, hard to sometimes come up with what are some of those ways. But, you know, much like the Lord speaks about the Christian and service in church, and he doesn't come to the Christian when it comes to their using of the gifts in the church, say, go discover your gifts. Actually, that's not what Scripture says. You know what Scripture says to the Christian as they are within the body of Christ? He says, serve. And as you serve, guess what you're going to find? Your gifts. Um, and so, too, all right, where's this extra mile? Uh, it, it, it isn't so much that he comes and says, this is the way you do it, and that's the way you do it. You serve, and as you serve, you find out there's the ways that we go that extra mile. Let's see if we can't get our next two questions in as well. Um, agree or disagree? Seeking to get the government to reflect Christian values so we can live a life free of persecution is actually another form of the prosperity gospel. Agree or disagree? probably a key in that agree, agree and disagree to help you in that answer. It's found in the purpose clause statement. Purpose. So, you know, for the purpose of so, so we can live a life free of persecution. What ultimately then becomes the goal of wanting my government to have Christian values? so that I don't have to bear a cross, so I don't have to deny myself. Um, yeah, it does become nothing more than another, 
another form of prosperity gospel. Do we, do we want our government to reflect Christian principles? Absolutely we do. Um, don't misunderstand the question. We're not saying we want ungodly governments. But if our reason, would, would Satan not love if it was the case, um, if we were content to live in a Christian nation that reflected some Christian vo- um, values um, simply so we wouldn't have to suffer persecution and have nothing to do with the spreading of the gospel? Then he's got us. He's got us thinking of this life and this life only. Rudy. They're there so long, as long as their government abides by them. Um, but it doesn't mean the government will always abide by them. Um, as we talked about even you know, last week, look at how governments started, some governments started out wonderfully um, as Christians lived in them, and it completely changed. Um, and, and you stop and you think about it. At no point do we ever see our Lord say, or even do we see the Christians um, say, hey, but at one point we had these, um, you don't have the right to take them away from us and rebel. Um, it's not what the Israelites did in Egypt. And we have the freedom to write, write letters and see if we can cha- make changes that way. Um, absolutely, we have you know, freedom to, to resist in, in ways that are in line with what the law has to say. Um, but I'd come back to the whole point of our lesson this evening is that if my whole goal in all of this is letting people know what I'm against. How well am I really reflecting the truths that Christ wants me to be reflecting um, when that's what's all encapsulating my thoughts and everything that I do? Um, Let me also, and if not more, be reflecting what I'm for. Um, There's going to be where the change is, and that's going to be the thing that's going to continue to let the gospel be proclaimed. Um, it was a while ago, not everybody here, and, and I, um, I'm more than willing to lend my book to anybody, um, but last year when we began that book, Would the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? If you recall, one of the false Christs that was laid out in there was the National Patriot. Um, I would encourage you, if you have the book, as these days coming closer to our, our election come up, to read that chapter again. Um, like I said, I'd be more than happy to lend you my book, um, and you could read that chapter as well. Um, a valuable reread, if you've read it once, a valuable read if you haven't read it yet, um, of that, just a reminder of, of when, when we tie the kingdom of grace and the kingdom of this world together, we ultimately make Jesus a savior of my American ideals rather than a savior from sin and the forgiveness that I so desperately need. Final question. What comfort do you find in what we've learned about church and state so far? Um, would somebody like to read that Second Chronicles 20 verse 6 passage that you see there? Go ahead, Penny. Lord God of our fathers, are you not the God in heaven? Are you ruling over all the kingdoms of the nations? In your hand are power and might. There is no one who can stand up against you. So, that which we've looked at so far, we kind of summarized what we looked at last week with our beginning here, um, and then... These other things we've talked about here today, along with that passage, what comforts do we, do we find in, the fa- in what we've learned about um, church and state so far? Rudy. You, you touch on two aspects there. Our Lord is in control, 
He's going to work things out for the good of his church. And we can kind of take those two and meld them together in the aspect also of saying he is going to use the state one way or the other with this recognition or not for the good of his people. And, you know, we won't really dive into it. We could, we could have a history Bible class um, again and again um, to point on at the fact of how throughout history in the most inopportune times is when the gospel has been spread the greatest. Um, so totally not the way we would think of it. And yet the Lord is, uses a, a, a state that is so contrary, so against against Christ and against the kingdom of grace and uses it to further the gospel. And, and maybe one other thing that, that we talked about last week, especially in that psalm passage, Psalm 2. What do we know as far as who is going to win? Christ. Christ is going to win. He already has won. And even in these, in these times, we know ultimately he wins. Um, you know, sometimes, I think I said this before, sometimes we have this tendency to um, think that we need to be upset for people to know how much I'm against something. And sometimes there's this aspect to it where we don't get upset and people think we don't care. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is we don't need to get upset and we can still care. And if other people ultimately don't think I think that I don't care, um, what does it matter if my Lord knows the truth in my heart? Um, and what comfort that gives to us in the ability to just kind of sit back and say, He's got it all in his hands. I will do all that I can within his word, within the abilities he gives me, the abilities that I have within the state, but never trying to confuse the two kingdoms and letting me serve in whatever way I can. Um, I think we have only just a, a minute or two, but anybody have any comment they want to make concerning that article or concerning the things that we've talked about here? Um, rather repetitive thought has come through our entire Bible study tonight, purposefully so. See nothing? Let's close with prayer. Lord of the nations and Lord of the church, we ask that you give us eyes to see the opportunities to serve you and others as Christian citizens. Help us to apply your wisdom to the situations we face as servants of the state for the benefit of our nation as well as for your glory. Bless our service under the government that our country may prosper and be for us a safe and stable place in which to proclaim your saving gospel. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.